and we will move on to our second speaker, who is, uh, I hope I'm saying it correctly, please correct me if not, uh, Birkan Sariyedin, um, who is from the Department of uh, Greek and Latin Philology in the Ludwig Maxim Maximilian University of Munich, um, and uh, studied Latin, German, and philosophy at the University of Munich. Since 2018, he's been working on his doctoral thesis that deals with artworks in the ethics of Homer, Virgil, and Ovid. It sounds fascinating, and that is supervised by Marcus and uh, Professor Bernard Tubner. Um, uh, he's also a member of the Class of Language Education of the Graduate School of Language and Literature of LMU in Munich, and he works as a research assistant in the excellence cluster Histor Mythos, uh, also directed by Marcus. Uh, um, uh, he also co-edited, I believe, the um, uh, Myth and Multimedia book that came out in, it's coming out or has come out in 2022. I haven't seen it yet if it's come out, so I'd like to see it's it. It's come out. Okay, so very good. So we are looking forward to that. And he's talking today about living books in the chamber of death, the myth of the labyrinth in Walter Moore's The City of Dreaming Books. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for the very kind introduction. And I'm going to share my screen now. I hope you'll see it. So, imagine a city entirely devoted to literature. Imagine standing outside its city gates made of giant books. Imagine smelling the dust of millions of antiquarian books and the fresh printer's ink in the city. Imagine hearing the melodic crackling of the thousands and thousands of pages turned at the same time. Imagine stepping through the city gate and seeing at least a dozen antiquarian bookshops, publishing houses, literary saloons, shops specializing in bookmarks or ex libris in every single street and everywhere only one thing, books. Old books, new books, expensive books, cheap books, books on shelves, books in barrels, books in linen and leather, books in all kinds of colors and sizes. So imagine if you want to paradise, paradise for all those who love books on and adore literature. And the name of this city, to which I would like to take you for the next couple of minutes, is Bookholm. The city is located in the fantastic continent of Zimonia, created by the German writer and comic author Walter Moers, and on which nine novels and two graphic novels are set. Today, I'm going to speak to you on his fourth novel, which also is the first that is set in Bookholm, the city of dreaming books. The aim of my paper is to show you how Walter Moers is reworking ancient myth and literature in his text and how important intertextuality is for his poetics. The city of dreaming books, as you shall see, dissolves the boundaries between high culture and popular culture and uses the myth of the labyrinth as a complex meta narrative. But first things first. Since many of you probably are not familiar with the plot, I will summarize it briefly for you. In the city of dreaming books, the Lindworm Optimus Jarnspinner tells how he becomes the greatest writer of Timonian literature. And uh, by the way, all the pictures I'm going to show you are from the graphic novels. The novel begins with the death of his godparent, Dancelot Wardwright, and on a deathbed, he gives him a manuscript, an unknown author sent to him many years ago. And as Optimus reads this text, he is astonished because this piece of literature is perfect in every respect. It is the best text that was ever written and the best piece he ever read. Optimus Jan Spinner knows that Dancelot sent the author to Bookholm, and so he sets out in search of the poet. The city of Bookholm is not only devoted to literature, it is literally built on literature, since under the structures of the city, there are giant catacombs containing millions and millions of valuable books among monsters and perils. These catacombs are called the Labyrinth of Bookholm. In Bookholm, a publisher directs Optimus to Smyk, who is the richest publisher in Simonia. At his house, Smyk reveals that he controls the book market of Bookholm and wants to eradicate all odds. He drugs Optimus and transfers him to the, to the Labyrinth. Optimus Jarnspinner survives numerous dangers until he finally reaches Shadowhall Castle, the place where the Shadow King lives, a mysterious creature who rules the labyrinth and kills everybody who sees him. Shadowhall is itself a labyrinth within the labyrinth, where Optimus finally meets the Shadow King and learns his story. The Shadow King is the author of the mysterious manuscript and he has gone to Smike and has been drugged just like Optimus. 
Smike realized, realized that this poet would destroy the entire literary scene as his perfection would be unattainable. No one would read the mediocre books that he sells in mass and every poet would concentrate on writing fewer but better texts, which is why the Shadow King had to be eliminated. He was therefore transformed into a monster by giving him a skin of paper that bursts into flames when sunlight shines on it and incredible strength so he could be the ruler in the underworld. The Shadow King teaches Optimus all about the art of writing and finally decides to return to Bukholm with him. They find the entrance to the labyrinth directly in the Smike's house and enter his library. There, the Shadow King willingly steps into the light, for only there poetic creativity can be felt and sets himself, Smike and all of Bukholm on fire. Optimus Jan Spinner leaves the city and realizes that he has now become a poet and his first book is called, of course, The City of Dreaming Books. As you already may have noticed, the Labyrinth of Bukholm plays a major role in the novel and is, it is, of course, part of an ancient myth. I therefore want to show how Vitamers transforms the motive of the Labyrinth in his text. And just for clarification in advance, Labyrinths have just one pathway that leads from the entrance back to the exit. You just have to follow the path and will inevitably reach the middle and reach the exit. By contrast, a maze has per definitionem complex pathways leading in different directions. So, the catacombs of Bukholm are of course a maze, but as such they refer back to the labyrinth in a true sense, the labyrinth of Diderostedes. But that is not all. In Bukholm there are actually three labyrinths. Of course, the catacombs of Bukholm are the main labyrinth, but they are also kind of underworld. You do not enter this labyrinth horizontally, but vertically, that is, through a catabasis. This analogy of maze and underworld refers back to the ancient connection between labyrinth and Hades. On top of the catacombs, however, another labyrinth is built, since the architecture of Bukholm clearly evokes associations with the structure of the Cretan labyrinth. The city center is built as a spiral with the house of Smike just as its focal point. Smike's house thus forms the center of the city and the houses of his street also seem to stand so close together that they form an architectural unity and shroud the day in darkness. Although it was noon and the sun was shining, I had made my way through the narrow streets almost entirely in shadow. Optimus thus points out that the houses form an architectural unit of their own and this unit resembles the labyrinth. This is also indicated by the darkness that dominates the streets, which on the one hand refers to the subterranean catacombs of Bukol, and on the other hand refers back to ancient representations of labyrinths. Thus, for example, in Virgil's Aeneid, the narrator explicitly refers to the light conditions when comparing the Troia play with the labyrinth. Ut quondam creta, fertur labyrinthus in alta, parietibus textum caeci siter ancipitemque, mille viis habuis sedolum, qua signa sequendi frangeret in de prensus et inremeabilis error. Through this recourse to the ancient labyrinth motive, as on the need. The dangerous aspect is emphasized and the path to Smike's antiquary is marked as uncanny. He is, in a sense, the Minotaur of Bukon, the ruler of the upper-worldly labyrinth and as such the most dangerous adversary of the protagonist. And by the way, Smike happens to be half shark and half grub, so he is in hybrid just like the Minotaur is half cattle and half human. Let's now come to the third labyrinth, and this one is located inside the first one. That is, that is inside the catacombs of Bukholm and its Shadowhall Castle, which is itself a labyrinth with yet another minotaur. The Shadow King, which also is a hybrid being, half alive and half dead, half solid and half insubstantial, or if you may, half human and half paper. 
So, there are three labyrinths, and the ancient myth is transformed in multiple ways. This, of course, corresponds to the postmodern texture of the novel, in which there are no clear-cut correspondences between the characters of the myth and the characters of the novel. Instead, the myth is transformed in various ways, and we should not hesitate, in my opinion, to call this device with Claude Lévi-Strauss a bricolage. I want to show briefly how the characters of the novel reflect the characters of the myth. <clears throat> Due to the connection between Buckhorn and the labyrinth, Smike, who inhabits the center of the city and rules it as a whole, appears as the Minotaur. But above all, Smike, as the secret ruler of Buckhorn, occupies also the role of the Cretan king, Minos, who commissions Daedalus to, bite, to build the labyrinth. This connection is also called up at the end of the novel when Optimus' yarn spinner wanders through the last bit of the labyrinth without finding a way out before he meets an ingenious bookseller who, quote, didn't build the labyrinth himself, but completely renovated it. He also built a key that deactivates the labyrinth so that Optimus can walk through a, quote, the labyrinthized labyrinth that just resembles the classical Cretan labyrinth in so far, as it has no dead ends, but it is only a winding passage which brings Optimus Jan Spinner to the exit. The graphic novel takes this even one step further, in so far as the bookseller not only is the architect of the labyrinth, but also alludes to the tragedy of Daedalus, who was caught in his own maze. He, therefore, takes a precautionary measure so that the same fate does not befall him. The reference to the ancient myth is thus marked even more clearly in the graphic novel, and thus the connection between Smike and Minos is also accentuated more strongly. So I will skip this part because of the time and come back to number four. And I shall uh, now once again come back to the Shadow King. As I already mentioned, he is the ruler of the labyrinthine underworld, and as such, besides Smike, a second Minotaur. Therefore, Smike is in this relation again, just like King Minos, who imprisons someone in the labyrinth. In a sense, the Shadow King, the creation of Smike, is his son, and this genealogical tie to each other is made clear by both of them when they meet again after escaping from the labyrinth by calling each other father and son. By the end of the novel, the Minotaur thus escapes the labyrinth and kills his false father who has imprisoned him. At the same time, however, the father-son relationship invokes a second generational conflict associated with the Cretan labyrinth, namely between Daedalus and Icarus. And the novel quite obviously refers to this association by having the Shadow King and Smike's son burst into flames after his ascent from the labyrinth, just as Icarus did. But I won't return to the darkness, he said. Never again, whatever the, the circumstances. I told you once that it all depends how brightly you burn, remember? Till now, I've been no more than an aimlessly roaming agglomeration of paper, but now I'm going to inscribe that paper with a message the city of Bokom won't forget in a hurry. My spirit will blaze more brightly than it, than it has ever done. It will exert an influence no intellect, no writer or book has ever had. Both the Shadow King and Icarus burn because instruments, because the instruments Daedalus, respectively Smike, has given them, come too close to the sun. The paper and the wings bound with wax. Of even more central importance, however, is that the novel here also takes up the poetological dimension of Icarus' flight, as is particularly evident in Horace's Ode 220 and a shorter passage in Ovid's Tristia, and I'm quoting the shorter one, obviously because we run out of time now. <laughs> Ergo, cave liber et timida circumspicamente ut satis a media sit tibi plebe legi. Dum petit in firmis nemium sublimia penis, Icarus, aequore is, nomina ficit aquis. Based on these two comparisons, of Horace and Ovid, of the poet Wattes, or his book Liber, with Icarus, the flight of Icarus 
becomes a pathological symbol, especially in literary modernity, beginning with Baudelaire's Les Plains du Nicard. In this multi-layered tradition that has its roots in antiquity, the fire of the Shadow King now also stands and can therefore be grasped quite concretely in two dimensions. On the one hand, as an expressive figure of poetic autonomy, and on the other hand, as a liberation from literary tradition through the erasure of personified Simonian literature and its city, Smike and Bukholm. The consequence of the Shadow King's relentless pursuit of poetic perfection thus also ultimately leads to his self-destruction. Thus, the poet's physical demise is his actual liberation. His metaphysical immortality and the sign that his goal, the elevation above the earthly fetters of man, has been achieved. The Shadow King, the greatest poet of all time, merges into literature and ascends to the starry heavens and, as the Katasterismos makes clear, in contrast to the drowned Icarus, undergoes an apotheosis and dissolves as a text into the universe. All in all, the City of Dreaming Books refers to a whole wealth of ancient hypotexts on the labyrinth. In most cases, the text does not leave it at quotations or allusions, but transforms the corresponding passages in a complex and multi-layered way, as I just showed with the labyrinth. And this is, of course, just a, a very small piece of intertextual play in this novel. For example, there's another poet in the novel who is called Ovidios Verswetter, and is just like our Ovid undergoing exile. Or there are quite sophisticated quotes of Callimachus, but uh, they are a bit more complex, so I've just skipped it, uh, skipped uh, these for today. And although this analysis has thus brought out new facets of intertextuality in Waltermeer's novel, it remains to be said that the hypertext's excrement are by no means constitutive for understanding the novel, but they certainly open up new perspectives on the text and the hypertext cited, which are worthwhile in both directions. Thus, in the end, Smike proves to be right after all. Quote, the answers to almost all of today's question can be found in old books. Thank you very much.